Here we are very high because altitude is about 2,300 meters above sea level because we are in the central part of Papua New Guinea in the Mount Hagen Western Highlands and here we can see so a very high diversity in the forest and many shifera some are terrestrial like this some are epiphytic of course this one is very interesting because it has totally impressed veins bullet surface of the leaf which is rusty on the underside and we see this rusty event is perfectly easy to see on the young leaves this is a cordeline eh? not the same as in laoland it's not cordeline terminalis this one is thicker has thicker leaves it's in mountain it's a mountain plant of course we see we have clouds everywhere but hopefully no rain it's a rainy season now because we are in mid-march so it's a the last part of the rainy season and uh, hopefully now no rain. Tiny flower, perfectly triculate, it looks uh, really like uh, ericaceous plant, like a vaccinium, like a dimorphantera from here. Actually, it's not at all a member of ericaceae, it's an orchid. It's incredible because I did never see this kind of shape for the flowers of orchids. This is a Papua cedrus, the typical conifer of high altitudes in the islands. And we see the bluish under surface of the scale leaves. Very, very elegant conifer. The shape very umbrella, successive umbrellas. So it's a, it's a huge tree actually, 200 feet. It means uh, more than 60 meters high. This is a blood clump, 
of one of my beloved plants, plant family is Urticaceae. But the problem, I don't know actually if it's a Pilea or an Elatostema. It is very, very similar to many Pileas we can find in the Andes, in Colombia, in uh, Peru, with plagiotropic uh, fan branches. This one has tiny leaves, which are about five millimeters long and two millimeters wide, totally denticulate. They are alternate, so of course I should think about Elatostema when I see alternate leaves, but I know also that some Pilea can have a total anisophily. When they have plagiotropic stems, they can reduce totally the leaf opposite to the main leaf. So difficult to know. Actually, I see no flowers, but flowers probably in fluorescence also tiny. I see very small mounds at the base of the leaf. So maybe, maybe it's a elatostema, maybe it's a pilea. I can't say it has very strong stems arising from the ground and it creates of course vegetative propagation both through cuttings of the stems and also from the base and it creates a very beautiful population around this panda anus. Incredible this moss because I've seen already big mosses like for instance the Dawsonia in Borneo but this one is incredible by the global size but also because it is erect like a lycopodium or something like that and also what is incredibly huge is the diameter of the stem in the middle diameter is at least uh, four millimeters so I've never seen a moss growing like this and also growing from the base also in the same way as epiphytic lycopodium so it's a very very strange moss I have absolutely to know what is this plant It's one of the so many epiphytic and climbing species of Escalantus in the Jesnaya Sea. Big patch of a begonia, it's a, a totally erect species, about two meters tall, and it has flowers under the stems, pink flowers, both male and female. Now there are mostly male flowers, but I see many old fruits, so maybe male flowers are open before the females. I don't know what is this plant. When we see the leaf scars on stipules, of course we think either to a ficus or a member of Araliaceae. It doesn't seem, it, it is a little bit spiny. And when I see the inflorescence, so it's a member of Euphorbiaceae, but with incredibly long acumen. Acumen is a seven, 10 centimeters long. This plant growing close to water with medium-sized leaves. It looks exactly like a mini Asteraceae composite that were growing in gardens. Here I was surprised on what I see. This inflorescence. And what is it? It is a Gunera. We know Gunera is mostly from Southern Hemisphere because sometimes it's up to the north in uh, Costa Rica, in South America, but mostly are from Southern Hemisphere. And here in New Guinea, Gunera is perfectly growing here. So it's not at all a petazites or something like that. From temperate country, it's a Gunera. 
some juvenile are growing submerged inside the water. Yeah, you have the inflorescence and also on the left of the waterfall you have the fruit and the stems of inflorescence begin as pink with the white flower. And then they turn bright red when the fruits are developing into blackish purple color and the stems of inflorescence become bright red. So we see a climbing member of Erika C. We see the stems with the leaves here and it has incredibly beautiful red flower. It's a member of the genus Dimorphanthera, probably because stamens have two different shapes. And what is very remarkable is the convergence between this Ericaceae in the mountains of New Guinea with Ericaceae in the mountains in the high Andes of Peru, Ecuador. But it's also other genera, of course, in Ecuador. It's mostly Cavendishia and related genera. And here it's mostly Dimorphanthera. It's a totally translucent, bright pink color, perfect for birds eating nectar. This is a small round things along the ground, actually, are fruits of a ficus, just flagelly formed shoots coming from the trunk we see everywhere here along the leaf litter, so the figs are distributed among the leaf litters and probably eaten by birds uh, foraging on the ground and you see these stems come from this very small ficus, so it's a small species, not a big one, and we see the flagelliform shoots arising from the base, we see here two stems. We see the bower of the bower bird area is incredible because it did uh, totally clean in a perfect circle and remove everything and putting all the mosses around and in the center it did build a tower <laughs> made of branchlets and cleaning we see it's still working because not a single dead leaf in the middle so probably every day is cleaning and rebuilding partly this tower We see we are in South Hemisphere. It could be when you see the, this canopy uh, with the dense crown uh, exhibiting uh, the shadow between the small crownlet, uh, so the crown shyness. And it could be New Zealand, but it's not New Zealand, it is New Guinea, but also we find very similar notophagus beaches because it's a southern beaches but now we know they are not at all related to beaches they are very different but notophagus are among the tallest trees either in new guinea or new zealand and they are covered by lichens some epiphytes of course and we listen the sound of the bird of paradise so definitely it is New Guinea. 
This is a very small species of cordoline growing in forest understory, very close to water. It has also thick leaves, but it's not at all the same size as the, the big one. And the big one has the whooping inflorescence. This one has erect inflorescence, and we see the seeds not yet ripe, probably becoming red or bluish. I did not know that there were small erect cordelines like this. <laughs> Some varieties of a cordeline terminalis from Laolands are also small like this, but this is a species from the highlands, more than 2,000 meters above sea level, everywhere. Yeah. This is obviously a member of the Jesnayase since this an erect plant, we think first of all to Sirtandra, but actually when we see the shape of the flower with the calyx at the base and the corolla totally asymmetrically recurved with the stamens arising, emerging at the top of the corolla, probably it's either an erect agalmilla or maybe an Esculentus, but it looks much more like an Agalmilla. But for me, Agalmilla were always climbing plants, and we see this is a totally erect shrub. But we see also it has adventitious roots all along the stem, so maybe it retains some climbing habitus. This trunk is totally covered a kind of moving curtain of a giant moss and this moss is very interesting because we did see it growing on the soil, erect, totally erect, but it's very unusual to have so erect stems with a so thick central axis and uh, all the leaves of course macrophylls are distributed around but it's, uh, it can be half erect because it has these strong main nerve and also it has some ramification we see for instance all these stems with lateral ramification but it looks really like uh, epiphytic lycopodiums like upersia but we see from a moss it retains all the water between the leaves it's the biggest erect moss or drooping but not covering i have seen in my life And a very, very strange thing is that uh, the sporogons, the mosses, it spores the same as in ferns, but of course it's different way of propagation, are not at the tip, at the extremity, but at totally hanging under, under the stem. On this, I did never see this in moss. We see the, the shape, perfect cone shape of the tiny sporangia, red red colored with the apex of a very spiny tip. This orchid has are no leaves, only stems. It looks uh, really like a cyperaceae, like uh, a small cypress or something like that. Flowers are at the top of the cylindric uh, hair-like structure, so it is same as in most cyperaceae, it's stems and no leaves. There's a beautiful tree with huge leaves, denticulate and hanging inflorescences. I don't know at all what it could be. Uh, it seems that inflorescences have uh, bracts around and uh, ooh, I don't know we should look inside. Why could not be a, a Kibara member of Monimiaceae? It could be if the leaves are opposite. Difficult to see if they are alternate or opposite. 
It looks a little bit like a Soroya in actinidiaceae, but actually in fluorescence should not be like this. So it's a little bit of mystery. Uh, it's a dream for a botanist loving begonias. This is not a begonia, it's a, the other genus. We can find only in New Guinea, the genus Sam Begonia. Why Sam Begonia? Because actually all the petals are fused in a tube. We can see very well on this one. And we see it's a perfect tubular corolla, same as a Gisneriad, for instance. And this is a female flower. We see the tiny ovary at the base and this uh, utriculate uh, corolla. So it's uh, very special. This one is a male flower here with the base totally hairy. The leaves also are hairy. Everything is hairy in this Sam Begonia. Very few species, all native from New Guinea. This dream becomes reality to see Sam Begonia in New Guinea. This genus living only in New Guinea, a male flower on the leaves totally hairy. The beautiful bright green iridescent leaves of a the Sam Begonia, male white flowers. Here another one which has the main stem which is quite high, which is 50-60 centimeters, like uh, some urticaceae. And here also we see a very young stem with totally bright green leaves and red stem covered with hairs. So this plant loves water. Its habitat is very close to this forest stream in the Mount Hagen at 2,300 meters above sea level. We see side by side one form with tiny leaves and this one which has much bigger leaves. On the one I see this one now I see it is not Elatostema, I'm sure it's Pilea because it has opposite leaves. We see two opposite leaves at each node, even if one big, one small, in some cases two have the same size. And also this one has typical swollen internodes, typical of many Pilea. It looks exactly like the Pilea nutans, for instance, we can see in Andes of Peru and uh, the Andean countries. But this plant, actually, I cannot be sure it's a Pilea or not Elatostema because the leaves are very asymmetric at the base. They are alternate and the stem is very different. It is not swollen at the internode, it is rusty, but maybe it could be a elatostema. It is incredibly small, ferny like foliage. It's a tiny species of a climbing piper. We see the Hanging inflorescence, white and then turning green when maturing. It's climbing, we see these are the lateral shoots with fluorescence and fruit. And we see the main stem climbing, somewhat zigzagging. Choo, 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 choo. And we see the end of the climbing stem here.
It's a very small species of Elatostema with the inflorescence on the top. It is very special with leaves with three tips, trident leaves. This is a plagiotropic Jesnayase. It's a Sirtandra. Usually the opposite leaf is totally reduced. So we see one big leaf and just opposite uh, reduced leaves for each node like this. And the leaf is also asymmetric. And we see the flowers, typical flowers and fruits of Sirtandra, member of the Jesnayase among the Pileas, Elatostemas, another small Pilea, erect, orchid on the ground, ferns of course, this climbing thing, yeah, there are stipules, it's a member of Rubiaceae, maybe it's a, like a Musenda, something like that. Dendrobium flowering. You see the tiny yellow flowers of this dendrobium. Very strange Jesneriaceae, epiphytic. I did see all these strange things at the base. Maybe it's a Sirtandra, maybe an Agalmila. I don't know, but probably either Agalmila or Sirtandra. It is a very common on most of the trees, but it's the first time I see the flowers and here developing fruits. It's woody. Wow. This mossy forest is really the kingdom of Urticaceae, the nettle family, but non-stinging plants. Here, for instance, we see side by side an erect pilea with a swollen internodes, typical of many pilea species. So this is an autotropic species. Here, another pilea, but it is a totally plagiotropic one with bullate leaves and many, many ramifications, so totally different. Here, under a different genus, closely related to Elatostema, but which is Procris, axis of inflorescence becomes inflattened. A tiny species of Elatostema with two stems. Here, another species of Elatostema, the one with trident leaves. And above this, a much more shrubby, this I don't know which genus it is, which becomes 
quite big shrub, can reach about two meters, so it's incredible. Six species of urticaceae in only one square meter. We are at about 3,000 meters above sea level. We are just uh, opposite to the Mount Hagen range. Here, of course, not only birds of paradise and other birds, but the mossy forest, so plants are covering everything. Mosses are covering the trunks, of course, with many, many ferns. The number of orchids is incredible. We see many gesneriats. We see also, I see a climbing piper. Of course, tree ferns are everywhere. The huge pandanus also creates this canopy. Many rhododendrons, shrubby and tree rhododendrons. Also, alpinia and the other member of Zangiberaceae. The climbing Fresinesia are here. Many Melastomataceae also have very thick leaves. I don't know if it's uh, Osbekia, Melastoma, or other genera. And of course, among the trees, many, many things. Oaks uh, eh, and the uh, Notophagus, uh, Vinemania, among the Cunoniaceae family. So it's a very, very rich high altitude forest. And uh, also among the ginger, I see the this one that I love with the black fruit, genus Ridelia, the most typical genus of gingers in this high altitude forest of New Guinea. Very beautiful Pilea species. I think Pilea or maybe Elatostema. In this mossy forest at about 3,000 meters above sea level, of course, there are many ferns. And this is one species of Angiopteris, but it's not the common Angiopteris evecta that we can see everywhere in Southeast Asia. This is another species, a huge species, which has very strong stem, pecial. We see the leaf, the frond here, of course, very plastic frond, and we see this incredibly huge and beautiful developing frond, totally protected by hairs. Also, we see that the pandanus has a very thick trunk and many, of course, steel roots covered with mosses. Climbing almost everywhere are the climbing ericaceae, the dimorphantera. And here, a part of the frond of this angiopteris. So we see it as much, much narrower leaflets, not leaflets, eh, because it's front, frontlets, <laughs> like a pinae, much, much more narrow than uh, the usual Angiopteris evecta. But we see the swollen part at the base. We see a big clump of uh, one of these mountain species of cordeline, uh, which has very thick leaves and very well branched. Uh, it is of course totally different from the cordeline in New Zealand, uh, and also totally different from the Laoland cordeline terminalis. Uh, and there are different species in mountain. It's very well diversified and uh, very impressive with pandanus. It's uh, funny to see that the biggest plants here are ferns, pandanus and cordeline, monocots and ferns. In this tree fall, we see of course mosses with many orchids falling, but here what is very interesting is this Rhododendron, it's an epiphytic species of rhododendron, and we see all the roots 
congested in this mass of uh, roots and the uh, on the mosses, and uh, it seems it can survive because it, it keeps all its mass of humus and uh, it can go upwards again. So, probably, maybe in one or two years, we'll see all the fragrant flowers of this rhododendron. Of course, rhododendrons are very abundant in this high altitude mossy forest of New Guinea. Highlands of Papua New Guinea, not so far from the border with uh, West Papua, Yergantaya, and we are at about uh, 2,000 meters above sea level. And this waterfall is very interesting because we see many interesting plants growing around. With the pink flowers, we see this impatience, which is at the origin of all. The plants which are called New Guinea hybrid impatience is a plant that you can see in all the cities in summer of the world with the pink or white or purple or red color. They originate from this species. If I remember, it's an impatience platypetala. I have to check. And we see also another interesting plant which is carpeting with the bright green iridescent color. It's a member, of course, of the nettle family, and Elatostema, I say of course, because we know that close to this waterfall, many Elatostema are really growing as real fights because they are covered with the water. And another interesting species is the ficus with the very big leaves, ficus damarotti, with the two beautiful specimens here. And there are, of course, many other plants belonging here, an alocasia, for instance. A 
under the of the leaf is exactly the same color as the sepals of the flowers. The Medinilla, Melastomata family, tropical family, mostly in uh, Asia and uh, America. This fern has very prominent, sorry, light green. And when we look at the other side, wow, we understand that these sorry are totally orange. And it's, it's funny because it's totally flat on the under surface, but they are protruding on the upper surface of the frond. Probably a polypodiaceae. We are close to Tari. Now it's uh, quite high here. It's about uh, 3,000, 3,100 meters above sea level. It's a typical mossy forest. We see mosses growing everywhere. Orchids, of course, a lot of epiphytic orchids. Many ferns, eh? of course. This is a huge angiopteris growing here. There are some epiphytic Gesneriaceae here. For instance, uh, different tree ferns, of course, uh, at least uh, two species of Sayatea. Again, the Redelia, these gingers, typical of New Guinea, but I'm very surprised to see so high a uh, member of Gingiberaceae because at night uh, the temperature drops below zero degree. One of these specimen of a climbing Ericaceae genus Dimorphantera, which is quite reminiscent of the Ericaceae from the high Andes. I see maybe some developing fruits. This size, one or two centimeters, is perfect for birds of paradise. Many of these plants have these types of fleshy fruit, and of course, dispersal of the seeds is through the defecation after digestion of the pulp. So we see the very tough, tough leaves of uh, this Dimorphantera, this Ericaceae, so characteristic of this high altitude forest. Two more different species of Pilea with very bullate leaves, one with big leaves, opposite, typical of Pilea, of classical Orthotropus Pilea, and this one also. And we see the swollen internodes, typical of Pilea. One more pilea with plagiotropic shoots and very anisophilous leaf display. We see one big leaf on opposite, one small leaf which is placed in the upper part of the stem, so catching all the low light level of the forest understory. Here is a dark brown species of Elatostema, almost blackish and uh, with leaves totally bullate, crinkled. I see it's Elatostema due to alternate leaves and flowers on the top and a 
color is incredible and uh, totally plagiotropic with the shoots uh, about 10 centimeters above the soil catching the low light level and growing together with this so beautiful Ridelia small ginger same height 20 centimeters maximum and uh, growing together with this blackish gelatostema Ridelia I see here a quite strange plant, a climbing plant, climbing vertically. It has opposite leaves, fleshy, covered with hairs, with a dark purple under surface. If I break an old leaf, I see there is not at all latex, so it's not uh, Hoya or Discidia, not uh, Asclepiadaceae or Apocinaceae. Not at all Rubiaceae because there uh, are no stipules. I think that actually it's probably an Eschinanthus, a member of the Gesneriaceae. I know there are many, many species in Papua New Guinea or the New Guinea in general. Probably this is an Eschinanthus. Of course, it should be very interesting to see the flowers, but it's very, very beautiful. I love the upraised hairs and this purple under surface. This is an Elatostema and uh, one more we did see the dark brown almost blackish individuals and this is the dark green form it is also purple underside but not so dark as the one we have seen it was higher about 500 meters higher Moi, c'est pas des petites siatéas. I don't know at all what are these ferns. They have a trunk, <laughs> spiny trunk, just as many siatea species, tree ferns. It looks like a dwarf tree fern. I don't know. It's uh, totally erect. We see a beautiful population with trunks. I think it's an Angiopteris, but totally different from the species I know, especially Angiopteris evecta oligodifolia. It has wind gerashes uh, between, uh, in the middle of each uh, pinnule. Oh, I see the sauri on the under surface also. You can see like uh, swollen emergences. Not yet ripe, oh, okay. totally green. The swollen base of each lateral subfrond, main pinnae, and this is typical of Angiopteris. Leaves and here at the base. We see the stipules here, typical of this primitive family Maratiaceae. Here in this mossy forest, a cloud forest at about 2,000 meters above sea level at the Ambua area, close to Tari, there are orchids everywhere growing as high epiphytes, medium height, low epiphytes in the mosses covering everything. And this one is very, very strange. 
It's probably one of the so many species of Dendrobium. Dendrobium is totally overrepresented here in New Guinea and uh, Bulbophyllum also. Then this one, actually, when we see it, hanging stem with ramification, lateral regular ramification, looks much more like an asparagus. We see the stems erect at the beginning and then hanging down when they develop like this. This is a miniature Schifflera, a very small species of Schifflera. This is the leaves here, which are quite typical of Schifflera leaves. But uh, this species is a maximum 50 centimeters high here and already flowering. So in New Guinea, we have the giants, but we have also the tiny species. I think it's a member of the uh, Araliaceae. We have seen flowering along the road. It's a monocarpic plant. It becomes a tree, not so tall, five, six meters. We see this is a seedling, spines everywhere, a little bit like Aralia. It could be the Gunera or maybe another Gunera. It has long stolons growing along the ground. We see the smoky mosses because this morning there is a lot of light and the mosses are growing on a tree with uh, indentate leaves. I don't know what it is, maybe, maybe it could be a Soroya, something like that, because Soroya is in Southern Hemisphere also, mostly, so, uh, maybe. This plant really looks like an astil, but uh, we know astil, but of course, from Himalaya. But of course, there are some uh, genera from uh, Himalaya. We see, for instance, the diversity of rhododendron species uh, here in New Guinea, same as in Himalaya. We see also uh, oak family, yeah, the Fagaceae, also, so maybe it's astil.
so many fern species on these mossy rocks. For instance, this tiny one with a blackish nerves on the long rhizome is very, very beautiful. We see on the underside the black nerves. It's probably a member of Polypodiaceae. But we see another one here with uh, white hydatodes, another which looks uh, much more like a climbing davalia, a small species, at least the five species growing together on this small mossy rock. But the most beautiful is a tiny one with the black nerves. Yes, among the so many urticaceae, this one looks much more like uh, in the group of the Bumeria. It has alternate leaves. Oh, it's perfectly white. So it's different group of urticaceae. Probably it becomes a quite uh, bigger shrub. Maybe it's a group of the Debregeasia. climbing ferns with very beautiful architecture, group of uh, the Cranopteris, but this one is probably a Stichirus. Stichirus is a genus you can see in uh, Australia, for instance, the southern hemisphere, mostly genus, and we see all the new lateral forms growing here on from the tip. huge tree, maybe a notophagus. And it's uh, interesting because we see really what is a mossy and elfin forest. Today is very special because it's totally sunny. But usually there are the fog almost of the day. And we see that uh, epiphytic plants are growing on all the main branches of the tree. And we have really big patches of mosses covering the balls and in these mosses all the ferns, the orchids and also the epiphytic ginger ridelia plus the epiphytic ericaceae, the morphantera for instance, are germinating among these mosses covering the branches. It's a little bit in the same way as vertical garden because the roots are growing simply in the layer of mosses and there is no true soil at all. Here in this elfin forest actually we see vertical gardens everywhere along the trunks, along the branches and even along the soil because on the soil there are only mosses also. Here we understand a little bit more about the growth habit of this Dimorphantera among Ericaceae, so with the big leaves, with nerves very well impressed on the blade, and two branches growing and one other going down. It's not a tuber, but it's a little bit bigger at the base, and we see that there are roots perfectly embracing the trunk, host trunk. So here it's a little bit tuberized. We see the roots going down, downward, along the trunk and it reaches the ground. So it's a plant usually beginning its life as an epiphytic plant and then it sends roots along the trunk and reaches the soil. It's a, usually what we call hemi-epiphytic plants. Here we clearly understand the growth of this uh, Dimorphantera. What is this? It's an orchid. <laughs> an orchid? Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Probably one of the so many species of Dendrobium. 
on gig in fluorescence. Wow. This is a small hanging branch. Uh, belongs to a tree and probably a tree which will become one of the big trees of the forest. And it's very interesting because it's a conifer. It's a conifer, forest conifer. It's a podocarpus. And we know the genus Podocarpus and allied genera, of course, are mostly from the mountains in South Hemisphere. Of course, we can move a little bit along the Andes northwardly, and also we can find in Borneo, but mostly these conifers are characteristic of South Hemisphere, typical Gondwanian family of conifers. And it's interesting because conifers usually have very narrow leaves. Regeneration is mostly in open places, but advantage of uh, Southern Podocarpus and Agatis, they have wide leaves, same as flowering plants, but it's a conifer. It doesn't look at all like a conifer. It looks like a small rhododendron. So since they have wide leaves, they can have regeneration in the shade of tropical rainforest and mountain forest in the same way as angiosperm. So we see really that actually the conifers also create the wide leaf to be able to invade the forest, even the shaded places of the forest. Small species of uh, Medinilla in the Melastomataceae. Small because it reaches about one meter. It's a species which is totally coliflorous. Here, the small red berries arising from the main stem. Also, at the base, we see a new flower, not yet open. It's white, pinkish white, arising from the main branch at the base. And these fruits, of course, are eaten by uh, the small birds of the forest and story, which lack berries. Of course, it's not cassowary is not interested by this. Cassowaries are interested by big fruits of uh, many trees or very big shrubs. And they digest the pulp, and cassowaries are very important for regeneration of the forest, in the same way as tapirs, for instance, or deers in some other forests. Huge Fresinesia climbing along the trunk of the tree and which is almost a canopy. It has many, many lateral branches. And here we see that the Fresinesia, even the small species and the big species are very, very branched, much more than usually in Southeast Asia. And this one is one of the biggest species of this forest. I'm surprised to see at so high altitude, more than 2,000 meters, a uh, big fresinesia like this, but it's New Guinea. the young uh, developing shoots of uh, Dimorphantera in the Ericaceae, Pifitic Ericaceae, we see everywhere and uh, we see it's a rhythmic growth and uh, suddenly 20 or 50 or 30 leaves at the top of the stem are developing synchronously and they are totally pink, bright pink and hanging so in this way they are much more protected against the UV wavelengths because we are in mountain and there are quite a lot of UV wavelengths.
Blackish, Terrestrial Orchid, the group of Anectochilus, Goodiera, uh, all these groups, very beautiful with a white nerve, and we see the young inflorescence in the middle. It's a, a Myrtace, probably an Eugenia, or close to Eugenia, Cisigion, this group. And these fruits are typical of the fruits eaten by cassowaries. We see this other soil, these fruits, typical of uh, Myrtaceus fruits, like Eugenia, we see the four lobes. I want to check how are the seeds, if it's small or big seeds. Uh, it's a big, uh, yes. One big seed in the middle. Voilà. So the seed is not digested by the cassowaries, released in the feces. So it allows the regeneration of the forest. Another epiphytic species of Ridelia, so special genus of Gingiberaceae in New Guinea, and this one. It's interesting because we did see many orange fruit, pink fruits, yellow. On this one, it's interesting because we see that the fruit becomes black, and actually, it's a kind of a fleshy capsular fruit, and the black capsular part open in three valves, and thus the bright red pulp is exposed. This pulp, of course, contains the seeds inside, so it's a typical uh, contrast, uh, black and red is a typical contrast for many understory plants, especially for the seeds. So it's a small frugivorous birds of the forest, which are attracted by this contrast between red and black, and eat the red pulp and disperse the seeds. In this elfin forest, there are also a lot of the ficus species. And here we see one quite usual climbing species of the ficus. And another tree species of the ficus. We see the white latex. We see also the typical nerves web of the ficus with many small square design on the under surface of the leaves, which is quite typical of ficus species. We see a strange, very small species of Alocasia. I say a small species because we see that all the leaves are, are now the same size, so it's typical adult phase. It has very thick leaves, impressed nerves. So I've never seen this uh, small uh, Alocasia. It's uh, interesting. I should like to see the flowers, but no spadix. But we see it's a uh, quite old individual. French member of Zengiberaceae because inflorescence emerges from the stem. I know Plagiostachys, for instance, in Borneo, but uh, I don't know, maybe it could be an Alpinia. Alpinia usually is really at the top of the stem, of the pseudo stem that inflorescence emerges. The biggest Fresinesia of this forest. In the flowering stage, so we see the bright orange bracts, we see the spadix in the middle, it seems about three spadix, 
and we see the huge leaves and it's interesting because this species is almost monocolous. Uh, I say almost because it's a lateral stem but it's not at all same as many other, most of the Fresinesia which are totally branched laterally. This one is almost monocolous and it's very very bright. When it will be ripe of course it will be perfect fruits for for the birds, for the paradise birds, for maybe also for the rats, because there are many climbing rats in uh, Papua New Guinea. But um, for us, for our eyes, it's a pleasure. A climbing species of begonia, climbing all around with the small trunks. Probably the same as the one we have seen with flowers, pink flowers. Here I see a small flower along the stem. So it's very similar to some American species of begonia, but obviously it's not the same group at all. Epiphytic Lycopodium, now usually placed in the genus Uperzia, anyway. For me, it remains a Lycopodium. This one is uh, very particular because it has very long terminal part with uh, narrow scales covering all the sorry, all the sporange and sporangia. So it's uh, one third of the whole length and maybe still growing more. So it's, uh, the proportion is unusual. Usually the, the strobili part at the end of the stem are much shorter than this one. The tiny Nertera, probably Nertera depressa, a Gondwanian plant, huh? southern hemisphere, is totally covering the rocks on the dead trunks with the tiny red berries. It doesn't look at all like a coffee, but it's the same family, Rubiaceae, the smallest Rubiaceae. Actually, it loves fresh air and also temperate countries like New Zealand where there are at least four species, uh, mountains of Chile and here we are as equator but we are very high so they find their temperate climate. So it's really a southern hemisphere creeping, small creeping plant. Two big clumps of the Ridelia species, so these epiphytic gingers from New Guinea, perfectly in a global fan shape because all the stems are distributed really in a fan structure and the leaves themselves also are distributed in fan shape. We see the terminal inflorescence on the left side with the reddish berries not, may, maybe not yet ripe, uh, no yes, they seem ripe, it's a species with very small berries. And we see also that its shape of fan is very useful for the plant because in the same way as Asplenium nidus or some bromeliads, all the dead leaves are falling in the center, so this creates a, really a basket with accumulation of humus in the center. I did not know at all that the gingers were able to create this basket plants like this totally adapted to epiphytic way of life. Beautiful species of Alocasia, 
with very, very thick leaves, really like leather, growing very upward, and the reverse has a very beautiful purple color. It's not so common in the Alocasia, and also the bright red ripe fruits. The spata becomes totally red when the fruit is ripening. In Rondon Ridge, in the same mountainous central range at about 2,000 meters above sea level, we did find a Saint Begonia. And here, in Ambua, we see another species of Saint Begonia, which has a very narrow tube, but we see perfectly the shape of the tube for this female flower. And we see the five lobes of the corolla with a center which is deep red. Around there are bracts and we see the small male flowers, very different, like a duck beak. And we see the stamen in the center, tiny flowers. So genus Saint Begonia. Sometimes some botanists prefer to keep this as a subgenus. But when you see the shape of the flower so different, I think really that the genus Saint Begonia, Saint meaning coalescent together, so I think that Saint Begonia is a good genus. This is what they call here the wild papaya. But of course it's not at all a papaya. First of all, papaya are from tropical America. When I see the base of the leaf sheathing the stem and also the articulate geniculum just below the leaf blade, probably it's a member of the family Arabiaceae, so same family as Schefflera. But what is very strange is that it is a monocarpic plant. It means it is growing, growing, we see the big stem, and finally it has a huge inflorescence. And this huge inflorescence looks really uh, actually uh, like uh, agave or fucroya inflorescence at the top, and then after it dies. So now, around the Tari, we are in these highland grasslands. So it's a savannas. It's very strange to think about savannas in Papua New Guinea, but actually we are very high now, about 3,000, 3,200 meters above sea level, and the weather is very unpredictable. Now it's raining, it's a rainy season, but usually the dry season is very dry, at least for some periods of time. So it means everything is drying out, and also with the strong UV light, many plants are very sensitive to this high UV light, and almost every year during the peak of the dry season, there are fires everywhere. So it's why we have these grasslands which now are totally swampy because now is a wet season but in the dry season it's totally dry because it's a little bit like a peat, peat swamp so they can burn very easily. Finally what we see, the only surviving plants are the Sayatea tree ferns and we see all these black sculptures 
like totems in the savannah. There are some very tall, six, eight meters tall, some are medium and some are also very short. So it means that even in this very harsh environment, totally swampy and then totally dry in dry season, the Sayatea tree ferns can have a good regeneration because we see all the stages. So it's not simply remnants of old forest before the forest was cut. No, they can regenerate in this very special environment. And it's uh, the only plant able for that. So it's very interesting because uh, what I did see also, for instance, in New Zealand, where it's very windy, is that the only plants able to survive in very harsh environment are ferns and monocotyledons. Because when it's very windy in tree ferns, the apex, the growth apex is totally protected by the young fronds and also by all the scale at the top of the apex. In the case of cordyline, for instance, the apex of score is totally protected by all the embracing sheaths of the leaves. So actually, monocots and tree ferns are very, very powerful in this very difficult environment, either very windy, either with fires. Also, we did see some dead trees because there were, since about 20 years, more and more recurrent El Nino events and these El Nino events, of course, very dry spells, more and more fires, of course, and also for many trees, especially growing on the ridges, on the crests of the mountains are susceptible to die. But anyway, there is still a good, good, good forest in Papua New Guinea. The burnt grassland, we see everything is burnt many months ago because now it's the end of the wet season and we see that the tree ferns still have regeneration two young tree ferns short stem so it is probably already many many years old when i say many probably because they are growing very slowly internals are very short so the big ones we see which are five six eight meters tall maybe 100, 200 years old. Probably these tree ferns are very old because they don't grow quickly. And regeneration occurs, of course. In some cases, we see many of them dying because probably too much fire in some places. So it's a kind of a process with some dying, some resisting always, some with new regeneration. So it's a complete kind of a special ecosystem. So the story of this island grassland is of course a very complicated story. But interesting, plants are surviving here. Here is a tiny plant covering the rocks. It could be a dwarf genera when I see the inflorescence. It can be an umbilifer, eh, like uh, hydrocotyl. Maybe it's an hydrocotyle. It could be also uh, an acena in the rosacea, but I think when I see the stems, I think it's an umbelliferae, eh, a piace, so probably a hydrocotyl. Very strange hostel, genus Equisetum, Sphenophytes, the alternance of bright green and black zone. And it seems, of course, that the black zones are not due to fire, but simply to the structure of the tiny leaves growing in a circle around the stem. And these uh, equisetums, of course, are reminiscent of the giant uh, calamites of the Carboniferous era. It is very interesting, very zigzagging stems, 
Very, very elegant. I'm surprised to see in this uh, high altitude elfin forest because we are about uh, 3,000 meters above sea level to see piper, coming piper, covering most of the trees. It's the most important liana. And piper for me is always mostly a plant of low land or mid elevation, but 3,000 meters is strange and it's perfectly growing. We see, for instance, the red spadix hanging down here and everywhere. So it's a, also a strange thing of New Guinea, there are some adaptation to very high altitude of plants. Usually we can see in Laoland. Same for Jesneriase. This big velvety Jesneriase is everywhere as an epiphyte on the trees. And usually most of Jesneriase are growing at much lower altitude. I see another Ridelia. It's a huge species, but more than two meters tall. And it's incredible to see this <laughs> bunch apical terminal inflorescence with still some developing flowers, bright orange, and the older ones decaying with the ovary beginning to develop into fruits at the base. Really, New Guinea for gingers is the world of epiphytic plants here. We have so many Ridelia species. For instance, along this trunk, we see this one, fan-shaped. We see just above a smaller one with the reddish flowers with narrower leaves. And at the top, a big bunch of another species with hanging stems. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, here it's incredible, at least 10 plants live on the trees. So it's the only place in the world where Zagiberaceae have created these epiphytic species. I'm looking at another Ridelia. This one has a very bright orange capsular coat already open and we see all the seeds have already been released so we some have black capsular fruits some have orange like this some have pink so it's a very very well diversified but always ridelia We see this rubus with bright orange petals. I've never seen this. And the calyx, which is totally lacinated. We see it's a rubus. We see the leaves, three foliolet leaves, very typical of a, of a rubus. I can move it a little bit. But flower is so strange and so beautiful. This is a shrub of the Rubiaceae family, a Rubiaceae shrub, and it has very beautiful white 
inflorescence is uh, not yet fully open. It has bullate leaves, crinkled, same as for many plants in these high altitude forests. Quite a big shrub, it has been falling, no problem for it because it's uh, growing up again. These pilea have a huge inflorescences. <laughs> it's a strange, it's a totally coralliform inflorescences. It is erect pilea with perfectly equal opposite leaves, but huge inflorescence developing well abroad the leaf surface. A young sapling of uh, one of these important uh, families of trees from uh, South Hemisphere, uh, Gondwanian origin. It's a Cunoniaceae, probably it's a vine mania. Opposite leaves and stipules at the insertion along the stem. It becomes a big tree, not uh, hardwoody. It's one of the dominant trees also of this forest. vertically hanging epiphyte plant and I wonder is it a member of Ericaceae like the Morphantera or is it an orchid? I can say nothing I see succession of well-developed green leaves and tiny cataphylls, eh, scale leaves alternating but uh, I cannot say Epiphytic orchid, one of the many, many species. This one is uh, interesting, in the, especially in the way that it uh, closely has the same, same habit as uh, the, some Ridelia species with fan-shaped uh, leaves and collecting some more or less humus we see here in the center of the stem. So it's a not usual growth habit for orchids to be really fan-shaped like this. Another epiphytic species of a Ridelia, but this one has very long arching shoots, a purplish underleaf, with a long hanging inflorescence at the end, probably adapted to dispersal by bats. Red fruits of the big pandanus species, the most common here, and the fruits are edible for us, but mostly edible for cassowaries. The fruits, uh, probably some remaining parts of, uh, of the calyx, and here the hardwood seed. It looks good. <laughs> Here we have really the feeling of what means elfin or cloud forest. When we see, for instance, I remove this part of this leaf, all these filmy ferns, Hymenophilaceae, which has only one layer of cells, totally covered by water and hanging freely and usually 
Prime Minophilacea are much, much smaller, but here it's so humid, so these species can develop very big fronds. Here, at 2,000 meters above sea level, with a lot of rain and fog, they grow perfectly. Among the mosses, we see something actually totally different. It's uh, this small plant with tiny, tiny leaves and it is an elatostema, the smallest we have seen in this area. And it is adult because we see the inflorescence congested here. It's a really tiny species which has exactly same growth habit as the mosses. We see also here the inflorescence on the stems. So it is totally protected from desiccation in case of dry weather because it is growing among the mosses. On this reclining plagiotropic stem we we'll see also perfectly the tiny inflorescences. So we had the opportunity to visit different places in Papua New Guinea, the eastern side of New Guinea, from a lowlands uh, like around Madang or Karawari, so lowland forest, mid elevation around 1,500, a little bit higher, 2,000 meters above sea level, and even up to the grassland above 3,000 meters above sea level. So I had an opportunity to see quite a numerous plants, of course, especially, of course, uh, understory plants, uh, because it's uh, what I know the best. And uh, we know New Guinea is very rich, floristically very rich. But to know exactly how many species of flowering plants and ferns, some estimation around 10,000, 15,000, some more maybe eccentric estimations speak about 30,000, probably, more probably, between 12 and 15,000 different species, which is a huge number. Mostly when we consider that actually New Guinea belongs to the same structural geological event as Australia. So it did move northward, so it's really a southern part of the world, the Gondwanian part. But of course, reaching so close to Asian countries like Borneo, Malaysia, Celebes, uh, even the Philippines uh, more northerly. Of course, it was a big influence also of the continental Asian flora, so mixed together with uh, more southerly Australian flora. What I see in the forest, first of all, it's an incredible number of orchids, both terrestrial orchids and of course a lot of epiphytic orchids. There is a huge number of species, especially in the genera Dendrobium, which is the most species genus, and Bulbophyllum. Otherwise, about epiphytic plants, ferns are innumerable also. A lot of different fern species growing everywhere on the soil, on the lower parts of the trunks, uh, on the branches, everywhere on many, many species also of ferns. Among other epiphytic plants, of course, we can notice the very special genus of Zagiberaceae or gingers, the genus Ridelia, which has literally an explosion of species here. And it is a genus of mostly epiphytic plants, some are also terrestrial, but we have seen everywhere, even in Laoland, that you see them, even in Karawari, but Ridelia is mostly diversified in mountains. About the smaller basus forest understory plants growing close to the soil. Actually, it is not so rich. It is one family which has exploded in number of species in the nettle family Urticaceae. Wherever you go, sometimes on one square meter, you can find up to six different species, mostly Pilea and Elatostema. 
every place where you go, you see different species. Why? Probably because these small species of urticaceae have very limited system of dispersal. So probably, as we know that the New Guinea is a complex pattern of ridges, gullies, ridges, gullies. So probably once a seed arrives in a place, you have evolution through genetic drift. So many species appearing in different places and very few connections after with the mother plants. So you have evolution, very local evolution. And we see uh, in each place I did find different Elatostema and Pilea. Otherwise, it lacks totally all the small Melastomataceae that we find in Borneo or in Malaysia, for instance. I mean the genera Sonerilla, Philagatis. Uh, same in the small Rubiaceae. I think the genus Argostema, uh, for instance. Among where we have seen species of Sirtandra, some erect orthotropic, some more plagiotropic, but all the small Gesneria, all the Didymocarpoid alliance, I mean the Didymocarpus, Codonobea, Paraboea, which are so specious in Malaysia, Borneo, uh, here, nothing. So, among the understory plants, the small herbaceous species belong to Urticaceae. Of course, there are some other plants, but really the big majority is Urticaceae. Begonias, I did see some begonias and some Saint begonias, which, are, which has a flower with a tube. Begonias, of course, are well diversified in New Guinea. So it's interesting because obviously New Guinea is rich. Of course, also you have all the trees and, the, and also I did forget among the epiphytes also, of course, the Melastomataceae with the genus Medinilla. We did see quite a lot of species of Medinilla. Also, I was surprised about piper. There are many climbing piper species, even up to 3,000 meters above sea level, which is very unusual to, to see big festoons of piper around the balls of the trees at this altitude. On the pandanus, oh, it's impossible to forget the pandanus and their counterpart, the climbing Fresinesia. You see the biggest Fresinesia I've ever seen before, a tiny one. Uh, which has always the same juvenile phase and we see inflorescence appearing on this phase so it's kind of neoteny I mean the adult form on the retaining the juvenile vegetative state Fresinesia pandanus are very very diversified mostly in forest understory but also we see some pandanus reach of course the canopy and can emerge in the mountain forest and tree ferns, tree ferns everywhere so uh, still a lot of places to visit in New Guinea, but it's a, I'm very happy to have this uh, first uh, approach. Very different from what I did see 15 years ago in Irian Jaya. For instance, in Irian Jaya, I did see many epiphytic nepenthes. Uh, I did see the big, huge Miramicodia. Uh, so it's uh, not so far, maybe 500 kilometers from Tari when I was in uh, Irian Jaya, but very different flora. So again, the geography, the topography of New Guinea is probably responsible for this high diversity of plants and animals and of course also the same thing for human beings because in New Guinea we have so many different tribes. Why? Because we have this separation between cliffs and ridges and like gullies. So very few connections between populations. So local evolution. So what we see in the world of the plants, we see this also in the world of the human beings. Les pigeons qui tremblent dans la prairie Le gibier qui court et qui voit la nuit Les bêtes des eaux, la bête a servi Les derniers papillons soir aussi. Mais fond, au fond, ce nuage sanguin, oh, favorisé de ce qui est frais, expiré en ces violettes humides. 
dont les aurores recharge ses forêts. 